Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is his love for us. We're going to continue the teaching on the gathering. And this is part three of the teaching. I hadn't um, got it uh, finished, but I'm going to finish it today. Now, I want to base this off of, I don't know if you've seen um, Olive Tree Ministries, um, Jan Markell and um, J.D. Farag and Amir Safarti, um, they have a like movie thing. It's called Before the Wrath, and it it kind of um, it talks about the betrothal of uh, a male and a female in a Galilean wedding. So you know that Jesus was from Galilee, and how it correlates to the capturing up you know, with the saints, when we go to meet Jesus in the air, like the rapture, um, even though the the word rapture is not in the Bible, but it's um, described in a different way. So this is what it's based off, and it really breaks it down, how it correlates with that, and how as us, who are the um, bride of Christ, um, and Jesus is our groom, because, you know, the the church is the bride. It talks about how the comparison. And as we go along, you'll see, and I'll explain to you. Now, what I'm going to do is read Matthew 22 verses 1 through 14. It says, this is the parable of the wedding feast. It says, and Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out a, a other servant saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And with this scripture, here the Lord invites us to the banquet. And he had laid down his life for all of us. And he gives us an invitation to have salvation in him. And some people just won't go. He'll extend the invite over and over and over again. But at the one point, that window of opportunity will close. And for this, this feast, for this wedding ceremony, you have to have your garment ready. Your wedding garment has to be pure before the Lord. And if you don't come dressed right, guess what? You're not going to be attending this wedding. You're going to be cast out into utter, utter darkness. And what that means is, if you don't give your life to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, 
then you're going to be in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The parable of the great banquet talks about the groom coming for his bride. During this time, it speaks about the rapture of the saints of God. There is a strong bond between the Passover, communion, and the betrothal of the church. Betrothal means it's the first part of the two-part process of Jewish marriage. See, with the betrothal, it's different than how we get married. It's, it's very different, but we're going to keep going. Which creates the legal relationship without the mutual obligations. In Hebrew, it is called kudushin, which means sanctification. We can say kudushin or kudushin is K-I-D-D-U-S-H-I-N. We'll just say kudushin. Kudushin, the betrothal, it means to set, be set apart for each other. Sanctification, to be made holy. Kudush prayer over the wine at Sabbath to sanctify, set apart. Kadushin is far more binding than an engagement as we see and understand the term in modern English. Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, used a Galilean wedding ceremony to describe the sacredness of the marriage covenant between a groom and his bride. Jesus is from the town of Nazareth, which is in Galilee. Galileans had a certain way of doing things and communicating with one another. The Galilean wedding recreates this ancient event, bringing amazing insight into a glorious future, the day the church is united with Jesus for all eternity. It will be our greatest day and his. These marriage practices are in with the covenant Yeshua made with us. And it shows the importance of the vow that he made to return with his bride. Unfortunately, throughout the years, this tradition has been lost. Many people haven't been taught the ancient traditions and customs. Many members of the church do not realize how much the betrothal and wedding symbolism plays a part through much of the Gospels, nor do they realize exactly what the new covenant really is and how important it is within the marriage symbolism. A traditional ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony has two simple, minimal requirements. Those requirements are first that the bride accepts an object from the groom that is worth more than an equivalent value of a dime, something extremely small in value, along with what is called a statement of documented acquisition, a document validating the marriage, which is like a modern-day marriage certificate. And second is consecration of the marriage after the betrothal period. When these two acts of the wedding day are completed and witnessed or confirmed by at least two people, the marriage is official. A wedding is the most important thing in the Middle East. You can't have a covenant without a great amount of witnesses. That is all that is needed for a valid ancient Hebrew marriage, like the ones that the disciples of Yeshua the Messiah and their ancient ancestors themselves for thousands of years were familiar with. The betrothing process, which leads up to the marriage, 
would start when a man took a liking to a young woman. The man and the father of the man, if he is still alive, approached the father of the young woman for her hand in marriage. So basically, the man had to sell himself to the young woman's father. He had to tell him how he was going to care for his daughter, what his finances, assets, and skills were. Mind you, there are witnesses watching the events unfold. Gifts are given. A dowry or bride price is negotiated with the bride's father until an agreement is made. The dowry was for, for the bride if something happens to her beloved groom. Someone hands the groom a pitcher of wine. The groom pours the wine into the cup and hands it to the bride. She can push back or accept the cup. The bride drinks from the cup. The groom takes the cup and drinks from the cup too. That's the, that represents the last meal. So remember when Jesus, before he departed, he said, you know, that when we join him, we will sup with him. So it's like a form of communion. It's a covenant. We are his bride and he is the groom. So we will have, we will have supper with him. Luke 22, verse 14 through 18 reads, And when the hour was come, he sat down in the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. 